Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Point Man Podcast. I'm your host, John Imperial, and I have Phil Pelletier here with me tonight. What's going on, buddy? Hey, John. How you doing tonight? Uh, not too bad. Before we get into this podcast, guys, I uh, wanted to read a passage from a book called The Last Punisher, written by Kevin Lace. And it starts off with, On my second day in the team... I drove the van to work again and braced myself for another day of team building. When I met my platoon chief, he was wearing a blue EDT SEAL instructor shirt with the sleeves rolled up, green shorts, and freshly spit-shine jungle boots. A gruff Italian-American from New Hampshire, Tony, of course his name was Tony, wore jet black greased hair back like a cliche. His vast experience as a frogman spanned eight combat deployments, and he had all the tattoos to prove it. A spiderweb tat splayed out on his right elbow, eventually giving way to at least two other ink jobs on the same arm. On his forearm was a trident, the word frogman. He looked me up and down with a a disapproving scowl. Then he grunted and kind of jerked his head back toward his office as to say, follow me, new guy. I sat down with the first of many one- one-way conversations with Tony. When he finally spoke, his New England roots announced themselves in his thick clam chowder accent. Tony was a genuine Blake, break glass in case of war kind of guy, and I looked up to him from the moment I saw him. As I walked out of his office to start my day of team building, I felt good knowing Tony was my platoon chief. And that, that book uh, was written by a former SEAL, Kevin, uh, Kevin Lease, who goes by the nickname Dauber. And uh, when I first met Tony myself, it was, I think it was about 2013, probably on the summer of 13. I kind of heard uh, for, the, for the grapevine about, you know how it is, Phil, being in a small town and mm-hmm. and you get to know a lot of people and you know people who are, you know, going to point other ones or other others out to you and... I saw this guy coming in on his Harley at the time, Frogman, New Hampshire license, vet license plate, and I had heard the tone of the stories about Tony, and you know it was one of those uh, guys that I knew from, you know, just being in the area that I that I had to get to know this guy, and it was a uh, friendship that I didn't really see coming, and one that I'm glad that did. Tony's kind of whenever I've needed him, he's always been there to uh, either answer the phone. Or, you know, a text or a call, whatever it is. And whenever we were out training, if I said, hey, Tony, I, I, can I borrow you for today? I, we have some training. He's always been one to jump right at the opportunity and come out with the guys and uh, and do some training. So, yeah, was- it's awesome. I think, uh, I think Tony's always been that local legend in the best sense of that, you know, expression. Just I, I can't think of, uh, of a time I ever didn't hear his name spoken with reverence you know what i mean like he, he's been there done that he was the real deal exactly exactly it's kind of that 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 lore that just hey there's this guy tony Afradi, and you know and you, you get to know him hear the stories about what he's been doing and you know he's one of those guys that is just pure genuine people he's gonna always come out there and and uh and help you whenever you need it and uh and tony i'm, I'm glad to have you here with us tonight man how you doing all right yeah, I'm I'm doing wicked good, chum. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I didn't even know that you had a podcast. Like, uh, you may have told me before, but you know, I drink a lot, so <laughs> I, I couldn't really figure it out. But I'm like, are you out of your fucking mind? Of course, I'm going to go on this show. I appreciate it, man. It's uh, you know, it's it's a uh. It's been a, a journey so far. This podcast, like I was telling you before we started, this is the uh, this conversation right here is the easy part about it. But <laughs> wasn't it like when you started it? Wasn't it like this is impossible? But then again, it's like no, it's not impossible. Yeah, exactly. It's not a, nothing's impossible. No, it was. It took a lot of studying about how to actually do it. How to. How to get it done? What equipment you needed, and everything's right. different. You know, I would have thought a microphone's a microphone, and the, they're all they're all different. They're different. Which ways they're facing? How they're going to pick up audio and shit like that? Uh, and it's the first day I met Jonathan. I was like, right, we're going to be friends forever. It's you know, <laughs> you know how you meet some people and it's just like that. 
And immediately I called him Gronkowski. Matter of fact, when he texts me, I'm like, Gronkowski. Because he looks just <laughs> like Gronkowski. Oh, yeah. He's a big ape, you know? He is. <laughs> yeah. I think, that's, I think that's like his number one nickname back home. Well, I don't think I came up with it. You know, I think it was. I think it was. Uh, right? Downsy. Right? <laughs> Downsy, right? I think Ivan Maybe. did. Yeah. It could have been Ivan. But he's such a he's such a gorilla, you know, and everything. And I'm like five foot eight, nothing. And... <laughs> no, it, it uh definitely one of those friendships that uh that I didn't see coming and uh I'm glad it I'm definitely glad it has and you know, we've kind of just been there for one another whenever we've needed it and uh yeah. I'd do anything for him. I appreciate it, man. I'd do anything for anybody. Just you ask. Will. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. You just came back up from the uh, southern part of the country, right? Yeah, well, you know, I just came from, uh, I was in Florida, and then I went out Wyoming hunting, whacked a big mule deer, and drove back here so I can kill my whitetail here. And then I'm probably going to go down to Florida. Yeah, back down. Yeah. How's the, uh, the corona down there dealing with that? It's not like you think it is. No. Nothing. Like it's like whatever. Everyone there down down there wearing masks. Either got it. Yeah, you wear a mask. You go in a store. It's not like I don't know down down in Florida. I don't like know anybody. Yeah, it's not like Gorham, New Hampshire. That around here, it's like fucking whatever. You can't go to the store without running into somebody you know. No, you can't even drive down the street with raising your hand five times. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I get you. Yeah. I right. get you. No, that's good, though. You see, you came up. How's the, how was it down there, though, dealing with the corona? Was it just normal, kind of like up here? No, nah, not really, man. We were down there, and uh, it was uh, about six weeks we are locked down, and then we're not. But I didn't care. I just stayed home. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at it like a military deployment. Huh. I built a gym in my garage. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't really know anybody anyway. So I just stayed home and whatever, you know. It's all going to be good, whatever. Exactly. Exactly. We're all going to be fine. But, well, that's, uh, that's good to hear. You uh, you came back up and obviously voted for the, the during the election last week. Well, that's why I came home. Yeah. Yeah. New Hampshire's still obviously a residence. Home up here. state, born and raised. There you go. Yeah, so we uh, told a few people that you'd be coming on, and you know we have uh, definitely some some questions of you know people have uh, <laughs> given us and, and whatnot. So, but yeah, I just wanted to start off really with, uh, a little bit. Really, people know you. They've heard <laughs> they've heard of you from me, the Jocko's podcast. You've been on what two of them now? Yeah, a couple, but. You've, you've been featured in, what, like I just read for one book, you've been, what, featured in four total? I don't know. Four books. People have, someone's portrayed you, Ray Gallegos has portrayed yep, you in yep. a movie. How was that, seeing somebody else portray you in a movie? Well, Ray Gallegos was, he's like, uh, he's like exactly my same age. He was like 52. And that was four years ago, or whatever it was. Yeah. And he's a straight up like Mexican dude from friggin' Los Angeles. Like the tattoos and everything on his forearms. And Clint Eastwood's like, well, you know what? These other cats. Now, Ray Gallegos looks, he, he kind of like looks just like me. Yeah, he does. And I was talking to him, you know, he texted me and. Kevin's like, Ray Gallegos needs to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. Dude, fucking wicked good chum. Yeah. He's like the salt of the earth. He's been in like 70 movies. Yeah. He's, he's an actor. Yeah. Yeah. You he's know, and he's few. like, and he still texts me. Yeah. He's like, hey, man. You know, Merry Christmas. You know, whatever. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. You know, how was it seeing somebody... Play Tony. Uh it was it was a little bit different. Yeah, <laughs> but I, it but it wasn't it wasn't as crazy as you think. How do you mean? 
I mean that when I met Ray, he'd already been texting and calling me for like 30 days. Mm -hmm. So when I went out to Los Angeles and the city of fucking queers and whatever, <laughs> but, and then he was like the, the coolest cat ever in the history of ever. And then I met Bradley Cooper, who was the other coolest cat ever in the history of ever. And then I met Clint Eastwood. And I shook Clint Eastwood's hand. I go, well, I'm not usually starstruck. And I was like, what the fuck? This is <laughs> Clint Eastwood. This is the hand that pulled out the 44 <laughs> Magnum on Dirty Harry. Right? <laughs> and I go, Mr. Eastwood. He goes, no, 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 no. Call me Clint, Tony. Yeah. And he, he was so respectful. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, ah, okay. So then again, you know, I'm, I am who I am and I'm a fucking, re I'm retarded. So I go, well, how are you going to keep this shit up there directing shit, Clint? He goes, well, I got a whole bunch of ex-wives and I got nothing else to do. And he hits me on the shoulder. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect, brother. <laughs> But those people, Clint Eastwood, Bradley Cooper, and Ray Gallegos, they're actors. So they're always on the, you know, they, but when I was with them. They're always learning and they're studying nothing. You. They're nothing but nothing but cool people. They're best people in the world. Yeah. It, it's just like me and you, chum. Just sitting down here and talking sort of thing. Yep. yep. You know, it's a. Uh... It's funny you say that about Bradley Cooper. I was just listening oh, to... Oh, he's the best. I was just listening to a podcast uh, today, and he Bradley was... Well, actually, not Bradley, but uh, Eddie Vedder was just on Howard Stern's Eddie podcast. Eddie Vedder. Yeah, yeah, from Pearl Jam. He was just yeah. on Howard Stern's podcast. He's another good cat. And he was saying that uh, when... Because that... Uh, I can't remember the the name of the movie that Bradley did with uh, Lady Gaga, and my fiance's gonna kill me because Star when... is Born. <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, you... now I gotta yeah. watch every yeah. movie he's in. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Not that I like that movie. Like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, fucking. Oh, no, I I I haven't watched it yet, but I've heard nothing but good stuff. But Eddie was saying, you know, he was approached by Bradley because, um, the uh, Bradley's Cooper is basically you know Eddie Vedder. And that's not who it's portrayed after, but that's the the rock star that he went with. And so he studied Eddie when yeah. learning for the movie. And Eddie told him to begin with, and he says, don't do it. He goes, no one's ever gotten a rock star right. And so he went to the, the premiere of it and said, he goes, I was going to tell him if he did a shitty job, but Bradley Cooper knocked it out of the park with how he got a rock star and portrayed a rock star. Let me tell you something, chummy. Bradley Cooper knocks everything out of the fucking pack. That's right. Yeah. Wicked. Yeah. When I was out there in Los Angeles on the set of American Sniper, I'm like, hey, Bradley, let's go to fucking Chum's trailer and have some beers because I bought a bunch of beers. Yeah. He's like, no, Tony, I don't drink. I'm like, you don't drink. We just got in a, like an hour argument. <laughs> About, because he's from Philadelphia. Okay. Philadelphia, Red Sox, yeah. baseball. I'm a big baseball guy. And he goes, no, no. I'm like, why don't you drink? He goes, because I'm going to concentrate on my career. And I went, roger that, brother. Like, yeah. like, he's a professional. That's awesome. But he left when I was in the fucking pissa. Now the pass because I'm on my half in the bag. <laughs> Forty five minutes later, that cat comes back to Ray Gallego's trailer. Comes in and goes, "Hey Tony, I didn't say goodbye to you." No shit, huh? He drove forty five minutes back to L.A. Came back like fuck. That's gave awesome. Me, gave me a big hug. That's a stand up man. He's everything that everybody ever thinks he is. 
He's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's Very good to cool. hear. Very I cool. couldn't say anything more about the about the man. Well, it's good to hear. You know, you hear a lot about... I, except he's a Philadelphia fucking Phillies fan. You know, I'm like, I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. So go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. but stand up, stand up cat, man. Yeah. Well, that's awesome to hear. You know, you hear a lot about... Uh, you know, people being starstruck and whatnot, and you just got to remember that they put up their pants on the same way we do. You know what I mean? Oh, They're yeah. just normal human beings. Exactly, and, you know? Yeah. But, uh, no, so it's it's funny that, you know, I don't know what how I would ever deal with, like, someone, the John Imperial, not that anyone's ever going to make a movie or me, of, of me, but or that I'll ever be in one, but, like, someone playing me, you know, it, it seems like they got, Ray knocked it out of the park with you. And that was uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't know how to deal with that either, Jonathan. I, I really didn't. But whatever. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, my, it all started. Chris Kyle called me when he's still alive, mm -hmm. and he goes, "Hey, Tony, fucker," <laughs> and I'm like, "Hey, what's going on, chum?" He goes. Well, I'm going to write a book. I'm like, does Taya know about this? Because, I mean, Taya, she's like the most badass chick in the fucking history of the world. Oh, yeah. I go, she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got to use your name. I go, Chris, I don't give a fuck. Because back <laughs> then, it wasn't, you know. Yeah. It was. I mean all this whole shit started, kind of. Like, Chris, you do whatever you got to do, man. Make your money. You know, I knew. I knew. I mean, he's... He's Chris Kyle. Yeah. And he worked for me. And, I mean, I would fucking yell at him and it would do... But, he worked for me. He's my brother. Like, whatever you got to do, brother. He goes, all right, I just, I, I, legally, I need to call you. I'm like, fuck legally. <laughs> you do whatever you got to do, chum. And then he wrote that book, you know, and I was like, oh, okay. And if, I've actually never read the whole book. Mm -hmm. But I have, he sent me a whole copy signed. And, but, you know, he portrayed me as a, like, good cat. Because mm -hmm. I was. You yeah. Know, he didn't fuck me over. And then it went on from there. I'm like, you know, America. Then he died. Mm -hmm. He got fucking killed by some cocksucker out in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't go to the funeral. You know why? No. Because I was right here down the street mm -hmm. in Gorham, New Hampshire with the fucking flu and I couldn't get out of bed. No. I couldn't go, but I still stay in touch with his wife, Taya, and the kids. Colton, you know, his, his daughter, they're doing fantastic, man. They're they're just the best people. Glad to hear that. I know you... Uh, Jonathan, I'm telling you, they are the best people. One night, you and I were together over at down the street at a restaurant, and you ended up calling Taya with, with, with me and uh, sitting right there, and that was... I. You still remember that to this day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. But uh, how long were you in the teams for? 26 years. 26 years as a team guy? Yeah. Well, 24 as a team guy. 26 in the Navy? Yeah. What year did you enlist? 1986. 86. Well, I enlisted in 85, but I was on delayed entry for a year, so. So you went right after high school? I was the first person in my high school class to retire. No shit, huh? Of course I was. <laughs> Did you guys write then? Every even my my teacher, uh, I can't remember her name, and I'm not gonna say it, but she was wonderful. She was such a wonderful teacher. Yeah. She goes, "Well, you need to have a backup plan, there, kid." And I went, "No, I'm not gonna have any. I don't." I'm not a backup plan kind of guy. She goes, well, that's kind of a big thing that you're trying to do. And I'm like, 
No. No, that's what I'm going to do. So you went. So you knew you knew right away that it was of course you know, I the did. Navy and then SEALs teams. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. How'd you hear about the SEALs to begin with? Well, back in the 80s, you didn't have any internet or any of that shit. Yeah. But all my chums, like Mikey and mm -hmm. the other Mikey, Demuros and Murphy, they're like, oh, yeah. That's like the ultimate. I'm like, really? So it's not like I Googled it or anything. It's just like, <laughs> holy fuck, these guys are badass. I'm like, well, that's what I need to do. So you did two years in the in the Fleet Navy. Yeah. And then decided to go right at right the Buds after that. Yeah. How was uh how was Buds for you? Did you know even know what to expect? Had you met a team guy before? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I it was it was awesome. Buds yeah. was like the best. Did they give you any sort of pointers before actually going into Buds? No, they just told me just be yourself and don't worry about anything. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just do it. Just fit, just focus on that mission right at that point in time. At that point. You know, it's, people always talk about like, you know. It's like the Q course in Special Forces. Yeah. Just don't, just handle one thing at a time. Yeah. It, it's kind know, of like life. Exactly. Focus on that mission at, at that time. Yeah. You know, and like I like I tell people, you go into the military or going into law enforcement, it's kind of. You know, what do I think of the academy? Literally, oh, the academy, it's same same shit, right? Just just get that. Just you wake up in the morning, you go to PT. Don't worry about getting fucking anything else done. PT. I mean, you go well, home and you life's easy. Yeah, you everything is structured for you for you yeah. to succeed. All you got to do is fucking pass your PT and pass your classes. That's why I'm not a good like regular person because my whole life is like terrible. <laughs> No, it's like, because I think it's all about SEAL teams. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it there's one there's something to be said for that. The, there is a lot to be said for that. You know, not, people, they come out of the military into a regular job, and they kind of fall flat on their face. And I don't understand why. I'm why? Like, what, what the fuck is the matter with you? Well, people, they don't, they're used to that structure. Well. Like, you're, just, like you were just saying, you know what I mean? Well, Jonathan... You knew me when I got out of the SEAL teams. And yep. I came home, and I had no plan because I thought I would die. Mm -hmm. And I didn't die. I was terrible. All I did was drink and ride my Harley and fucking be a maniac. And Yeah. But, you know, then eventually you got to grow up a little bit. But I just didn't grow up till I was in my mid-40s. Yeah, which is well, a, it's not a bad deal. No, not at all. Not at all. It's just I was, I was, I had no idea what to do because I always thought I'd die, but I didn't. I got shot one time in the body armor, and I was like, "Yeah, whatever." <laughs> Nothing else from it, huh? I thought not even a broken rib. You no, know, I, no, yeah, yeah. I didn't even get, I didn't get that. I had a wicked big stomach ache for like a week. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that that was uh 2004 so that was uh, you and i had been talking obviously we've known each other for a while and i've heard some of your stories but when the first the first time that you could have gone over for the actual war on terror was was it 04 or a little bit before that 01 01 and that's when you went to new zealand first right yeah i went to a tracking course that had already been scheduled because we didn't know that shit was going to happen. Yeah. So I went to New Zealand for like six or seven weeks to learn how to track people in the woods, like human tracking. Mm -hmm. Me and Derek Van Orden, who just ran for Congress in Wisconsin. Did he win? I don't know. Really? I don't know. I don't, I, I'll have to look it up. But he's, he's a good boy. Phil's our fact checker, so we can have him look it up. Yeah. Okay. Wisconsin, got it. <laughs> All right. Derek Van Orden. Now, Derek Van Orden is that cat who played uh, the senior chief in that Act of Valor movie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. With the beard. The, one with the beard, yeah. I was about to say that. He's my brother, man. Yeah. So you guys went over there and. 
Wow. Backtrack a little bit. He is such a good dude, man. He's like... Me and him have had a lot of arguments about stuff. But he's like one of the best team guys I've ever known in my life. He's just such a good dude. Like, he didn't care. He's like... Tony, like, you're, like, my best friend ever. I'm like, I know, Derek. You're, like, it's like all the other team yeah, yeah. guys. Yeah, I got it. The team guys are, you know. You know. But he's running for Congress back there in Wisconsin or something. I don't know. I think it's Wisconsin. We're going to have to look that up. But yeah, how how you had been. It says he lost. What's that? It says he lost from, uh, from just in the. The Google search, but yeah, oh, you... did he lose? I don't know. I haven't yeah. heard him. Yeah, unfortunately, oh, like that was you had you had enlisted in '86, yeah. and so all one happened. So you have let's say even numbers. Let's say 14 to 15 years in at that time, and you get you get told that something's finally kicking off. You had spent. What are you talking about? No, no, no. You're totally wrong. No, I went in in '86, mm -hmm. and in 2000. I was in the SEAL teams. I mean, uh, 90, 90. 90. Yeah, when the original Gulf War. And the original, I, w I yep. was in the original Gulf War. Okay. Okay. So I thought that was like, right, yep. fuck, of course, this is what happened, you know? Yeah. Did you I, have any? Uh... I was over there. I didn't do shit. No, nothing? Yeah. Some of my buddies did some stuff. But... Yeah. But I'm over there like, holy crap, this is like Vietnam, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to kill everybody and nothing happened. Uh, well. I heard you listening or listening to Jocko's podcast. Things. You had a, uh, you were saying that one of the real only things you did was uh, you dove on a chopper. Oh, yeah. We recovered some bodies. Yeah. You know, and, but it wasn't like combat. It wasn't like 9-11. Mm -hmm. Once 9-11 happened, it was like fucking game on, bro. Well, when nine eleven happens, and we you're, shot everybody. You're thinking that, I mean, okay. So the guy, let's see, for sake of argument, guys who became team guys in ninety ninety one that didn't get out before nine eleven, so they got ten dry years, right? Oh yeah. And here you are, you getting told that your was it your team, your platoon going over? Oh, we all went over. You all went over, but you have to go to this uh, to this course first before you headed over. Did you ever think that it was going to like pass you by without you ever getting a shot or no? Nah, not really. It was, you had to kind of deal with it, but you're talking about a couple of SEAL platoons, task units, assault teams that were, like, we were so trained, like, yeah. so, it was un, it was almost unfair. Yeah. It was like, just point us, and we're like, we shot everybody. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we killed ev all the bad guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's we killed good. all the bad guys in every place in, like, two days. Well, that's... Because uh... we're, we're the best trained tax dollars that you, you people should... Just go, oh, my God, my tax dollars are so well spent. What makes you guys the best trained? Because that's what we do. It's not a deployment. It's not this. It's, that's our profession. It's what we do every day. Yeah. So we didn't even want to come home. If they had, like, hot chicks and booze, I would have never <laughs> left. Yeah, yeah. Not I really. That. I, that's what you pay us for. You know, I've always... We're the best tax dollars you've ever spent in your fucking life. When uh, when people ask about like what makes people someone the best trained, how can you be the best trained SWAT guy? How can you be the best trained That's all SEAL? we do. Every day, all day, every day. Not only that, but I, I tell people that it's it's literally falling back on the basics. Oh, it's all about the basics. It's the basics brother. of everything. We do the the basics really well, and uh, and go from there. Well, if you ask anybody in any SEAL team, any anybody who's 
it, it's all about, okay, you're patrolling from some place to get to a building to kill a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Once you get in, it's all about close quarter combat. Yep. But it's. Yeah, no, it's, it's. You just walk in and you do your job. That's it. Yeah. And we're so good at it. It's about trusting the person that's in front of you, behind you, that you know you have their back. They know that you, and, uh, they and, have yours. And, and my chums are always like, people that weren't in the military are like, well, you know, SIL teams and Delta Force. I'm like, it doesn't matter. We're all we're all awesome Americans. But if we go into that building and you're like, what's the difference between the airborne cats who are awesome mm-hmm. and SIL Team Six? It doesn't matter. If we show up at your door, you're fucking done. Yeah. Like you're done. Like you're not, you're not gonna survive. When I'm talking to new guys that are, you know, on the force or even in the military, how how can I get better? How can I become really good at, you know, room clearing or interviewing suspects or whatever it is? And I and I I always tell them like, hey, it's it's literally knowing your basics very well. You do the yeah. basic shit over and over again. If it's and Phil, you know, you can speak to it. It's it's literally. When you're when you're clear in a room, it becomes muscle memory. But you're not doing anything fancy. No, it's not rocket surgery. No, exactly. Yeah, it's easy. No, the the point is, I mean, and obviously all credit to them, the seals are the best because they do it the most. They don't go anywhere without rehearsing it a thousand times. So it, you know, people can say it's muscle memory, but it really is. They look at every single contingency and they practice for it. You know, it's you you read about the level of training and dedication that they have. And obviously, Tony's the one who can speak to this the best. But that is literally why they are the best. Mm-hmm. Well, our, our chums in the SEAL teams that the taxpayers pay for. Everything is 3000 repetitions. 3000 is the key number. Every time you pull your pistol out, once you pull it out. I'm right-handed, so I pull out right. I present it, and I'm taking the slack out of the trigger. By the time I get there, it's time to do the business. Mm-hmm. That takes 3,000 times. That's So if, if me and you and Chum here enter a room and we're trying to train, it's going to take us 3,000 times to get used to each other. Is that something that... Uh... How'd they come up with 3,000? Some fucking, some study back in the day? No, but I, I don't know. Yeah. But it's right. Yeah, exactly. The more the more you do, the more you're going to know. And it's just that getting it over and over and, and over again. Built but into that for us, for us, like like me and you, Jonathan, if we were just doing room entries yeah. every morning, let's say we did 10 every morning just to keep our shit up with pistols or AIs or whatever, M4s, it would take us 3,000 times. If you do 10 a day, it doesn't take that long. No, exactly. Because that's right. our job. We're not doing this shit like, oh, for the deployment and once in a while. No, this is my profession. Mm-hmm. This is what I do for a fucking living. Yeah. And I'm going to murder every motherfucker that I that yep. presents a problem. Yep, exactly, exactly. Did you guys do a lot of uh, de-escalation or any de-escalation? Yeah, I, I, we did a bunch. I had some brass knuckles and uh, <laughs> I had a blackjack in my back pocket. The old blackjack. We still got a few kicking around to the PD. I busted a bunch of people right over their fucking cranium because, you know, well, I don't want to kill them. Yeah. But they're not. If you don't cooperate and I can't shoot you, you're you're gonna get beat up. Yeah, no, that's uh kind of with everything going on in America. I know for for policing, that's kind of one of the hot bush, hot button issues for us to deal with. I mean, we do it as you've seen. We do it we as much as we can and as often as we can. But it's just uh, I didn't you, know if you guys you, had trained. You much go into around. that knowing it. Like right mean? now, it's like terrible. The police who are the best 
ever in the history of ever. And I, you know, if they go, I mean, if I was a cop, I wouldn't want to be on one of those de-escalation things, sitting there and people are spitting at you, you know, out in Oregon or whatever, mm -hmm. queer bait states and shit like <laughs> that. But you now you're a police officer. You got to get the training. If they don't, if they're not telling you what to do, then you got to go with what you've been trained to do. Yeah, and you know what's you know what's ridiculous, Tony, is up until let's say the end of this year, because I know next year it's going to change. There's eight hours of continuing education training that a cop has to do to maintain a certification every year. Eight hours, but that's less than we do at the SWAT team up here. Oh, we do as much as we. Yeah, as you we know can. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah. what the fuck? But and it is like a basic cop who's not on the SWAT team, been on, been on the job working, is only going to do eight hours. That could be on the pistol. That could be defensive tactics. Why isn't that an hour a day, at least? Well, it's what you know. Honey, in the SEAL teams, it's like four hours a day. Yeah. All you do is shoot. You shoot. You shoot. You shoot. You shoot. You shoot. I and Jocko says, when I was listening to him, and he's been on a few different podcasts, he says that cops should spend 20% of their week training. Of course. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, no, definitely. It's something that we I... We uh... spend 20% of our time in a war zone training. Mm -hmm. Really? Every day, you get up and you train, you train, you train. Huh. A lot of people don't know that. Not something I wouldn't have, have thought of. What, what what are you going to do? Let your skills fucking... No, diminish? obviously you're going to keep them, whether you're dry firing or whatever it is. It, it doesn't matter for us in the SEAL teams. You're either in the, you know, in you know war zone or back in the States. 20% yeah. of your time, you're fucking shooting. Hmm. All you do is shoot. You know, I think it's with the cutbacks, they want to cut all the police funding and shit like that, and it's you know, well, you, how do you think? How do you expect for things to get better if you're going to take all the money away from it? Well, you know, I've been watching the news just like everyone else, and uh, I, I, I really, as an American, I really don't think there's not one politician that's going to run on a campaign that says, "I want to defund the police," but. Then again, they'll all go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, no, don't do anything. So you got these cops sitting there, highly trained, wonderful individuals. But they got orders not to do anything. So, well, why am I at work? I'll just go home. Yeah, it's not only that, it's that, too. It's, you know, they're going to, they want to, they're going to, Say defund the police and why? Why? Why would that ever be a talking point? No, who knows? I, I, it, it baffles me that it even is. But I mean, right here, right here, I got my thirty-eight that I carry in my fucking jacket. Mm -hmm. I got a couple of nine millimeters in my truck. Like, you know what? Carjack me, motherfucker! <laughs> See how that works out for you? Yeah. I'm going to blast you right in your fucking head. And I don't give a fuck about any of that shit. Well, what's hard is, you know, trying to tell people. I, I teach a lot of active shooter, uh, active shooter classes. And, I know you do. It's, yeah. it's perfect. And, uh, it should be more of that in the United States. And I and I tell people, I you know, whether it's civilians that I'm teaching or whoever it is I'm teaching it that day. And, uh, and I tell them, I say, you know what? The police are a great thing. We're a great entity to have. And except we suck at one thing. And that's getting to where you are when the shit is going down. Yeah. We're That's not that 20 seconds, man. Yep, or 20 exactly. minutes. Yep. But depending on, especially up here, it could be, could be 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, nothing's going to happen up here because we're, everybody's armed and we're all good, <laughs> good motherfuckers. And yeah, but there's it's no riots. There's none of that crap up here. And if you want to bring it up here, go ahead <sighs> and I'll meet you at the fucking line. <laughs> and I'll yeah. shoot you in the fucking head because <laughs> no really really no I get you it's you know it's it's trying to tell people like hey listen you know you have to you have to take care of yourself 
you gotta be worrying about yourself and protecting your family and it's you know you just want your kids to grow up in an environment where i don't know like everything's safe don't worry about anything yeah 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 so you spent 24 years as a team guy you went over first combat deployment was secondly in the first gulf war yeah and then uh you went through and after that you were from the 90s to 2000 there wasn't much going on oh there was a lot going on well i mean i know you guys are stationed all over the place in case no. stuff happens but it was it was way worse than combat <laughs> sitting around no no we trained hard when yeah. you hear these stories about navy seals like yeah like three times a week We'd swim like three fucking miles and we would shoot a billion rounds every week and yeah. just, just, and drink like maniacs because <laughs> that's what the American people pay us for. And your, your taxpayers, your dollars were no, I mean, they were well spent. What but, was your role back in, back? I mean, you had a few, uh, one deployment under your belt at least and then. Did you come right on as a uh, machine gunner? Yeah, my first platoon, I was a machine gunner. I carried an M60. Oof. Phil, Phil was a gunner. But it was kind of a cool thing to be a machine gunner back then. And in my yeah. second platoon, I became a point man. And I did that for six platoons. Oof. And then I was a leading petty officer, which means I was an assistant patrol leader. And then I became, you know, a chief. And that's about the highest I ever went, was a platoon chief, because that's, that's the, like the highest thing you can do in the SEAL teams, is be a platoon chief. And that was with Chris Kyle and them boys in 06. Mm -hmm. But by then, I had fucking 19 years in the Navy. Yep. I mean, I was, like, ready to go. It was perfect. Like, there was nothing. Uh, I wasn't, like, thrust into a position. You know, I was like, all right, yeah, here we go. All right. This is what I've been waiting my whole life for. And it didn't disappoint. No. I mean, all the, it's, it's a, I don't know if you call it a famous, but it's, it's a uh, deployment that normal people talk about. That weren't even that had nothing to do with the war back then. I mean, you know, you hear you hear Task Unit Bruiser, and you can you can say those words, you can say BTF, and people know what you're talking about. That had that were so far out of the loop back in 05, 06, 07, right in that time frame. It's yeah. you know to have uh, been a part of a uh, deployment that. No, I mean, I had uh, I had three officers in my platoon. I had Nikki Hill. I had uh, Mikey Hetzel, and I had Leif Babin. Mm -hmm. All three of them were Academy cats. Besides Leif, they were all new guys. And I go, well, here's the deal. You just do whatever the fuck I tell you to do. <laughs> and that was my ninth platoon. Yeah. By that time, you... Been oh, around. I, I, I've been shot at so many times, like my fucking, my, I don't wear underwear, but my underwear was <laughs> fucking Swiss cheese. <laughs> but I'm like, and they're like, all right, Tom, whatever. The best, the best fucking cats. You could, uh, Nick Hill and Mikey Hetzel and Leif Babin. It, jo Josh, I mean, Jonathan. You have no idea how cool those cats were. Yeah. They were just like they had the they had the officer mentality with the common sense thing right right there. I I couldn't have asked for anybody better than I was always looking for like no, but I, I couldn't find it because they were right on, man. They were the best guys and all my cats and even Jonathan Kim. Yeah, he's yeah, a, uh, he's like an astronaut now or whatever. Yeah, I'm like, he's from Korea. I'm like, of course, back then, you know, talk about racism. We're like, hey, you fucking Korean fucker. 
you know, and now he's like an astronaut. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? You can't even drive a car. <laughs> You're going to drive a spaceship? <laughs> yeah. you uh, Out of that entire you know, Charlie Platoon, Delta Platoon, you have, I can name, I mean, social media is kind of exploded. You know JP Denell? Oh, yeah. I, I follow He's him. like I, my brother, man. He's the best guy ever in the history of ever. I take his, uh, he's on the echelon front, which is Jocko's online yeah. classes that I take. and uh, and uh, But you have, out of all those guys, you have a lot that have, kind of blossomed out of that is that you know you have johnny came you get jocko lave jp yeah. kevin it's you know all these guys that are just and i came home and go to new hampshire and got shit faced <laughs> <laughs> yeah but nothing wrong with that you mean you nothing did, wrong with you that. did your time nothing you know wrong with that, you, and you say that tony but you've you've done a lot for people without even knowing it i mean like i said for me every anytime i've needed you or needed to talk or Hey Tony, you want to come train with us for a day? Boom. Who's where, there? Where and when? Where we go? You know what? So it's you know, and you've done a lot for people around here as well. Of course, so I have. That's that, like you, know. you didn't just come right down here and, and sit on your ass and do nothing all day long. Well, most of the days I do. I just get liquored <laughs> up. And what but, do you think it is about? I'll say Northern New Hampshire, in, or you know, the Northeast in general. I mean, out of Gorham, you have. Including you, you got three team guys I can think of. Yeah, you have Berlin every twenty years. Every Berlin is Mike Durant. Yep. There's uh there's a kid in the one sixtieth out of Gorham now. Uh, you know what's and he's a, a real estate guy. Yep. He was that SEAL team one nineteen seventy two to nineteen seventy six. Yeah, right after Vietnam. You know. Yep, but you have you got. That seems Northern New Hampshire is a very small area. I didn't ask his name, you know, so yeah, I can, I can uh, yeah. black that out. But uh, you know, you have, Northern New Hampshire is a uh, a very small area, and what do you think it is? I mean, that seems like it's a pretty good percentage of people just in special operations. I mean, there's others probably out there that that were either in Ranger Bat or work ethic. Yeah, got a work ethic here. Jocko's from Maine. Yeah, right down the street. Exactly. He's done more for that town. His whole thing started up. That That's where he makes his product. Yep. But, you know, like me and Jocko don't talk like that. I'm like, mm -hmm. He's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I make like a bunch of M's. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Right. For y'all, you know what it means. Yeah. I don't know. I you You can't put a, you can't put a thing on it, Jonathan. You can't. Say, like, people who make it through Buds grew up as surfers. Because there's guys from Texas, New York City, New Hampshire, Michigan, Iowa. You just, it, 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 it says, who wants it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's all mental. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's, I, it's six months of terribleness. It's like, pure hell. But I loved it. I... I I never once thought about quitting. You know, you and I, when I enlisted back uh, three years ago now, uh, you and I had talked about it, and I was pretty much, you know, straight up in front with you. I'm like, Tony, I think I could do it physically. I don't know if I could do it mentally, like you mm -hmm. said. And you and I, you, as we were talking before this podcast, we, I had other shit going on in my life yeah. that I had to be dealing I know, with. No, you're not ready. Not exactly. Ready. Exactly. You... You said it. It was literally the thing they got you through was that's all you had. I had nothing, nothing terrible, like nothing. All I all I had was Budweiser and the teams. That was it. And all I drink and you know make it through Buds. And when you got there, when you got to the first, let's say your first team, was there many guys with any combat experience at that point in time? Yeah, we had about ah. Uh, uh, we probably had like every team's got about a hundred operators, but we had about seven or eight guys that were from Vietnam. Still, at, even at eighty five, eighty six, right. or eighty six, eighty seven, yeah, yeah, and they were they were awesome, man. They they would, I mean, you're over their house all the time, drinking beers, having a barbecue. Mm -hmm. Sitting there talking, and then when you went to do training, 
They were right there with you. They knew everything about you. Because that's how they were raised. So, you know, once we got a little bit of combat experience in us, we tried to do that, you know, because that's how we were raised. Yeah, it's... It must have been a... a, 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 a I don't even know what the word is I'm looking for, but just to, to bring that experience, you started with, you know, seven, eight guys that were in Vietnam, and then you come back, and you have, at that point... Everybody. You retired 2012. Yep. Everybody had combat experience. Yeah. How was it that transition for you to become the, the guy in the team now putting on the training? I mean, I only got 10 years as a cop, and I talked to the new guys, and it's like, was I that fucking dumb 10 well, years ago when I, when well, I, when I started? It, it was actually wicked awesome because in 2010, when I came back from Afghanistan after my last one, mm -hmm. I was there for like a year. When I came back, everybody, of course, you know, got like, yeah, whatever Tony said, good to go. A year later, my, I'm retiring because in a year, everything changes. I don't want to be that old guy, that old boxer trying to, you know, I'm like, you know, the battlefield changes. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know. It was all right. Yeah, it's tactics change. Everything changes. The battlefield. It changes uh, daily. Every day. Yeah. Yep. The tactics the enemy's using against you. Yeah. So I don't want to be the cat that's like training cats and going, oh, yeah. And they're going to go, yeah, dude, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. We don't do that anymore. And as soon as somebody says that, I'm like, okay, I'm done. Because I, I don't want to, you know. Was that kind of the straw for you? No, I had already put my papers in to retire, but I was doing shit that was not legal, not authorized, but I was training cats. And then. And by not legal, you mean not authorized. It's by the Navy and, and right. not, you're, you're not cutting through but the red like, tape no. to do this training. So people came out and they're like, are you teaching this? I'm like, yep. And yeah. I, went, I mean, as I'm a medic, I can't even stick somebody stateside. Oh, no. I can't put IVs in, technically. There's I'm, so much bureaucratic red tape I'm that shooting, I have to go through. I have guys shooting right through glass windows. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, that's dangerous. Everything's dangerous. You so gotta get it done. Fuck? You gotta train it. It's what they're dealing like, with in real life. Everything. I was doing shit that was ridiculous. Yeah. And then, but I worked for a guy. I can't say his name on the podcast, but it, you know, Joe. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows if you work for Joe and you're okay, he'll stick up for you in a fucking second. And Joe's like, Tony can do whatever the fuck he wants. And I had guys doing, because that's, yeah. I mean, everything everything changes in a minute. Yeah. So I, you know, our guys built buildings, and I'm having them shooting through fucking Toyota pickup trucks, through the windows, smashing glass. I'm like, you got to get used to this. Blah, 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 you know. Joe's like, yeah, whatever he says, it's okay. Yeah, well, you need to get it done. You need but to train the guys up. That's the one thing, like I keep saying, the taxpayers' money, the SEAL teams, your money is well spent with us. <laughs> yep. Well spent. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Absolutely, man. All right, guys. Sorry about that. Welcome back. We uh, had to take a, a bit of a break right there. But as we were just talking, Tony, you know, like you were saying, this this election is going to come down to just a few votes either left or right, man. It's It's ridiculous. If you had to put money on it right now, what would you think? What do you, what would you think is going to happen? I don't know. I won two hundred five dollars on Thursday night football. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it, a shit show. It's 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 ridiculous. It's re absolutely absurd. It's ridiculous. I don't think. I think we're going to have an answer by Thanksgiving time, right before Thanksgiving. That's that's my that's my bet. Well, you know what happened? Of what they're going to say. They're going to say somebody wins by Thanksgiving, but then there's going to be the fucking the lawsuits and the court battles after that. You know what that you know what happened the day after the election? No. 
All the Republicans went to work the next day. And all the liberals and all their fucking junk people, they're just going to be blah, blah, blah. Like, And I can't believe half. That, this race is tight. Yeah, it and, is. And even if Biden wins, whatever, I don't care. Yeah, no, we were just but saying why we don't care this, if he wins. Wait, like, half the people, are you not paying attention? Just because the person I vote, if he if Biden wins, I don't care as long as he... Doesn't win. Does does what's what's best for the country. Yeah. You know what and, I mean? And, and Joe Biden is not going to do what's best for the country. No, but... He's terrible. <laughs> He's been there for 50 years. What has he done? Nothing. Big, terrible, just awful. I'd be arguing with you if I disagreed with you, but... No, yeah, but I mean... The same way, and I, I think that's what I like about President Trump the most, is how much he actually, you know, seems to really deeply love our country and actually work for us to make us better. I right, mean, right. I think that's... He's almost unheard of like that as a as a president. I've been waiting my whole life, chum, for somebody to be in office who wasn't a politician. Is Donald Trump my favorite guy in the world? No. No, not at all. Of course not. Right. And there's a lot of things I don't like about him, but but he's not a politician. Why is he doing He got this? rid of all the people that were lobbyists. But I mean it, it's made everybody everybody around him become lobbyists uh, at the same time, but uh what's the other guy's name? Uh Dan Crenshaw, he should be no, president. What? Uh, Joe uh, Biden. <laughs> He's like, don't you want to go back to what it used to be, where everything was nice? I'm like, yeah, when you're all screwing us in the ass. Yeah, yeah. taking sixty percent of what you what you made. Barack Obama is the guy who got me into politics. Yeah, I didn't give a shit before. I didn't care. Why is that? NAFTA. Okay, NAFTA's good, right? Okay. Yeah. I didn't know it was bad. Trump was like, are you kidding me? He that's, killed jobs, sent them everywhere else. All the jobs are gone. Uh, yep. Yeah. Oh, what would Dan, you feel if, if, if yeah, what would you feel if he uh did you, first of all, did you see that commercial with him? I'll have to show you if you didn't. He made a badass wow. commercial about him running in Texas and yeah, uh, the guy with one eye. Oh, the guy with one eye. He's a team oh, yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, I know. And uh, Danny, you... Danny Crenshaw. I, I don't know him personally. Okay, okay. I, I never worked with him, but He's a team guy, so of course he's going to get my vote. Because right? <laughs> I see him this morning, and he's like, you know, he's adjusting his ear thing like eight times Yeah, on Fox News. and But he's just like, yeah, yeah, here's what we need to do. They're all crazy. He's a team guy. You're going to vote for him, obviously. I would do so the same. So nothing bothers him. He's going to go. Here's what we're gonna do, and if you don't like it, go fuck yourself. Yeah, I mean he's been he's through a team it. Guy. He literally he's been he's been through how much. I can't do I can't run for office because I'm you know I'm a drunk, <laughs> but which is all right. But I admit it. Yeah, and that actually you know that'd probably be good because oh you're an alcoholic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. Move on. And then what? Yeah. Okay. What else? But Dan Crenshaw, you good boy. Yeah. He's a great boy, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, uh, he's yeah, it's down there serving in uh, for Texas. Congress in Texas, yeah, yeah. But no, we were uh, we were talking before uh, the podcast started entirely. You know, go ahead if you got to an answer, Tony. Let me know. Ah, uh, sweet, don't worry about it. All right, we're good. Uh, yeah, we were talking before this podcast, Tony. But the reason why I got it started, you know, and. I the, the the biggest thing for me was with this whole George Floyd breakout that went on. I saw a few different things that happened. I saw, you know, people weren't looking like at the police or the you know I say the police and the military, but the police they weren't looking at them like normal human beings. Number one, but number two is when I looked at that video about <clears throat> uh, Derek Chauvin, the officer resting on his neck, I didn't. I saw what everybody else saw, but I also saw something different. And I'm not any fucking visionary to to see this, but what I looked at it was the uh, the look in his eye when he had his knee on his neck. It looked like somebody who was I don't want to say possessed, but it, it it looked like he didn't give a fuck about human life. Pretty much possessed. Yeah, pretty much. And yeah, yep. you know. Whatever whatever the reason was for him to get involved at that point in time, I 
I, I don't care. I, I do care about the reason why that they were they were there, but he looked like he was you saw that that deer in the headlights look in his eyes and that guy needed some help. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast was to talk about, you know, the different different things that that uh that police officers need. And it, and one of the, one of the biggest things is in 2019, I think it was, or 18, Phil, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong on the year, but more officers had killed themselves and li- had killed themselves and committed suicide than actually had died in the line of duty. It was something like 225, 200, almost 50 officers had had died. So and why is that? I think when I started, I became a cop in 2010. And I still had guys that had started in the mid eighties. Why? Why is it so much more now? That I, I don't know. I honestly have no idea whether it's still the stigma that that is there. Because let's face it, when I, like I said, when I became a cop in twenty ten, it was if you needed to go get help, it was what the fuck's wrong with that person over there? He doesn't need to get like what? What the fuck? Like, can we trust him now? Can we? Can we rely on him? Is he one of the guys? Is he one of the boys? Is he can he be can he be trusted? Was the big question. Do you think it's ever the police officer's fault? For what? Ever, ever. Well, what You're do you mean? You're there trying to help somebody. Exactly. You don't get called. Even if, like, I I watched that video with George Floyd. Okay, whatever. Yep. Yeah. Is that is that right? No, of course not. It's probably terrible, but. Those guys knew each other. They worked at the fucking bar together. They did. But nobody reports that. No, exactly. That's got personal written all over it, buddy. That's got personal written all over it, chum. Yeah. And it's, you know, why... But why, nobody reports that. Why? Terrible. Well, why is it that people or and officers... And you blame the cops. Two hundred. Yeah, exactly. 225 officers had killed themselves and 170 had died in line of duty that, that year. And it, I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but the suicide rates in nineteen were two hundred and twenty-eight. Uh, yeah, so two hundred and twenty-eight. And I don't know if it was officers that they had dis- uh, just Billy, discovered. Bill, you, know. you know police officers, right? Right. How how can you like encourage them to do their job? I'm sitting here across from my chum, my one of my best friends in the world, and I respect highly. Going. Dude, how can you be a cop? Which, a, which uh, that shouldn't even be a fucking issue. I think I think that people who are cops, they just have that calling, and John can attest to that. And it's of course, know, of course. But... You you went and you wanted to be a seal. You had that calling. I think at some point, John developed that calling. I just so, really to tell you the truth. Cop. I wanted a legal method to murder people. <laughs> Who are like from the Middle East. So I'll admit it right now. And if they call me a racist prick, whatever. No, I just wanted to murder everybody. And then after a while, you get over that, you know, and it's like, okay. I think, you know what, the, obviously everyone has their own reasons to get into the job. Right. Of course. Right. So I think it's. But law and order has to be the first reason. Yeah. All right. You didn't do this job. The first thing you want to do is protect everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you guys, you don't get... Ah, well, up here is not a good example. But in these fucking disaster cities, like, I don't blame them cops for, you know, like, standing there with their arms folded, like, watching shit going on. I, I don't blame them because, I mean, come on. What are they going to do? Yeah. Not, not get backed up by the people who were... Elected to back them up? What kind oh, of horseshit, it's, cocksucking crap is that? It's a failure of leadership. Of course it is. But at some point in time, chum, at some point in time, now I listen to MSNBC, ABC, Fox News. I go back and forth because I don't want to be a one. I have to listen to every side. That way I'm not, not like, uh, ill-informed. I like that, though. You got to. 
He's yeah. got him. Well, you all these it's people. It's too easy just to go to Fox News. It's way too that. easy because then you know what? Everything you see is going to be geared to what exactly you want to see. And right. if you don't get any exposure to the other side, then you you're not going to. You, you have to. You have to know both as sides. As an American, you have to. You do literally, that. you you need to because you know what? Like you just said, we're all Americans. We're all into this fight together, in right? Four fucking years. Four years. I've been doing that, and they've never, ever once, not one time, convinced me about whatever argument they got. I'm like, well, you know what? Yeah. Well, getting back to it, you know, the main the main reason why I started this is I know cops needed, not only cops, there's a stigma when it comes to mental health. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I know. And so I, I know you and I have talked, and we've, we don't see any issue with people going to get fucking their screws tightened. Because you know what? It's something as simple as Jocko says. If they called it literally the brain mechanic instead of the counselor, I probably would have gone earlier. Right? Well, he, he, he's, you, he's much more attuned to that. But you as a police officer, that's such an under, under whatever category. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yep, you're you right. walk up and there's a situation, you got your gun in your hand, and now all of a sudden it's a mental thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to put my gun in my pocket, but I have to look at this as a different situation. Yeah, everything is different from how now, you, all I know you make is, it this All I know is bad guys whack them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. It's so you. much easier in the military, you yep. know. Yeah, but so the the reason why I started this podcast was to help reach out to those people that say, hey, that may be thinking of that stigma and be like, hey, you know what? I need to go talk to somebody, but I don't want to because I'm going to be associated with, well, they're going to take no, my gun or not. take my badge. Of course not. That's that's awesome, Jonathan. I think that's the coolest thing ever, man. I appreciate if that. If you need help, Get it, because there's people out there who will help you. I mean, I just... I'll help you. Oh, yeah. I don't even give a yep. fuck. I'm not affiliated with nothing. Mm -hmm. But if you need help, I will help you in a second. No, I appreciate that. It, anybody, anybody. And, you know, I th I just lost another uh, guy who was a, a Marine, and uh, he served in the Hampshire Guard to suicide a couple weeks ago. And it was just... It's just another one of those things, you know, just like, Why? Fuck. Why? Just reach out. What happened? Uh, he hung himself, but yeah. I mean, what what is so fucked up in your life? You hang yourself? Yeah, I don't Are know, you man. Out of your fucking mind? Yeah, and it's there's, just like... there's hot chicks out there. There's booze. <laughs> there's like good times, like just. Yeah, I understand. And work, I understand. And, but I I don't know. Did you uh, when you dealt with that general, did you ever have like somebody come to you with? Saying that. fix the suicide rate and, and oh, stuff like oh, that. So, uh, Chum, what he's referring to is I was in Iraq and uh, I think it was like 04, maybe 05. Yep. I don't know. Yep. And I was in this place at this point in time, whatever it was. And I was sitting there. And I got this guy next to me. And he's a one star Marine Corps general. Yep, and he's like, "Oh, I'm General So and So." I'm like, "Yeah, whatever. Shut the fuck up, because I'm, you know, I'm I'm looking down range on the scope." <laughs> so then I, I get a second. And I go, "Well, you know, sir, I, I, you know, this is my profession. I don't didn't mean to be yeah, yeah. rude." He goes, "No, no problem. I'm Tony." And he's like, "Oh yeah, I'm General So and So," and we're talking. And he goes. There was a hundred and something suicides this month or this year in the Marine Corps. And I said, this is 2004. He goes, we need more training to help these kids. I'm like, no, nah, you don't need more training. You need to just treat them better. You come back and he's, the Marine Corps is the best fucking Marine Corps in the world. Phil's their... getting excited right now because he's a former Marine. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they do their job. And I've, I've used the Marine Corps a hundred million times. You know, I'm doing this 600-person operation, and I need 70 Marines. 
and the lead guy is Lance Corporal. And everything's fucking awesome. But I'm like, he comes back after a year, goes back to Camp Pendleton or, you know, Second Mardev, whatever. And, and you got him on Firewatch. <laughs> He's going to fucking kill himself, man. Well, you were saying that that, that general was talking about you guys were over in theater at that point in time oh, yeah, right right and, there and those guys I hunt- shot a guy 14 minutes after that <laughs> yeah and I so mean, to me it's no big deal <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah whatever but he's it, like oh it's chilling yeah shut up you're over there in theater yeah and you they had a hundred and some odd suicides yeah back in that was like oh four or oh five wow i'm like he's like we need more training about it i'm like nah just treat your people better. Why do you think that, that people are people, man? It's not. It doesn't matter. Why do you think that that is? People are over there in theater, and that's happening. Oh, because it's terrible, man. Yeah, you got you're, you're witnessing fucking people getting blown up and guts and. I mean, to me, it's no big deal. I mean, to yeah, me, that's my profession, but. Well, you get these guys that have four or five months worth of training, and then they're sent right over right. four or five months after being in the Marine Corps of the Army. And and those those are the real heroes, not me. That's my profession. Like that, I, I signed up for this. Yeah, this is my what I do for a living. These kids who go over for like a year, or you know, eighteen months or whatever it is, they got minimal training, and they're they're thrust into this fucking life of violence and death and it, it fucks with people man yeah definitely and it, it does really not... does and they're, they're the real heroes the national guard people who deploy for a year like well, national guard back in 05 they signed up 06, for the national guard they were not to go overseas <laughs> right they were uh, they're an integral part of the more they were deployed for a year and a half I know, I know, I know. That, that I think about that. Obviously, you know, but I mean, back yeah, World War Two. Okay, you're over there until the war, the world's right. The war is over. Excuse me, but, but there. Knew- Go ahead, Phil. What? Is, is it, but you knew that. Yeah. It's, it's totally different. Yeah, exactly. I mean, National Guard back in o five o six is over there. The Army Army Reserves over there for a year and a half. And what was your your, your uh, rotation like? Was it six, eight months? Yeah, uh, sometime. Seven. Yours was seven, Phil? Mine was yeah. like six months, a year, then six months, then eight months, then three weeks, then... What was your workup time for for, for Test Unit Bruiser back in... Well, that was two. like a year. A year of workup? Yeah, which was unusual. Phil, when you over to, went over to uh, Afghanistan, what was your workup time? Um, I When I got to my unit... It was the end of the summer, I want to say August, maybe September. And uh, they had started like very uh, small, like platoon sized um, exercises. Okay. For it. Uh, and then we left in uh, end of February, I want to say, beginning of March. So, I mean, you're looking at eight, nine months probably of a workup. Yeah, to, right. be deployed, to be deployed for seven months. And what was turnover? How long was that? Two weeks, month. <sighs> turnover for what? Like when we got in? Well, no, when you left. Excuse me, when you left. Uh, uh, two months. Eight. It's like a week. Yeah. 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 A week. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Left seat, right seat. Two, and it's just two a week. Weeks, two weeks if you're lucky. Yeah. Well, you got you know the advanced the advanced group that comes over and stuff who are really just working with the chain of command more so, than you see with us and supply to and all that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's the uh, the reason why I kind of started the podcast on it was just to you know talk about mental health and whatnot and and to actually kind of end the stigma. Because I know when I started, it was kind of like the old the old cops that were just like, you don't need to go fucking talk to somebody, whatever. Don't go fucking talk yeah, to anybody. You do. You yeah, you, you really need to. Yeah, need to get that screw fucking tightened when it's when it's that time and whatever it is. Unpack. I mean, cops are always dealing with. Oh, we're gonna. He's gonna talk about all that crap, but 
a year ago, we were at the Boston Bruins game, and we're walking into the fucking thing. And I'm like, dude, I got my knife. He goes, just shove it in your boot. And I went right through the fucking... Remember? Oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah. We're so gooned up. Oh, Holy yeah. fuck. Well, the best part about that was... uh. <laughs> <laughs> I know Beck had uh, she had tried to get you on the jumbo screen that oh, yeah. night, oh, yeah. but there yeah. was another seal on the jumbo screen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't remember who it was, but I you. Know but I, I asked him, Tony, you remember that who it was or whatever? And you're like, there was another seal. I think I was fucking black out by the <laughs> middle of the uh, third period. Oh yeah, we got gooned up like no one's business. <laughs> <laughs> Veterans Day. Yeah, yeah, it's our Veterans birthday Day game. Yeah, yeah, it's coming up. I oh, yeah. know. What do you got plan for the uh, old Marine Corps and then Veterans Day game? Or Veterans uh, Day going down in Boston. Yeah, meet, yeah. meet my That's girl bad. there. She's she's the best. You know. What about you for the the Marine Corps birthday out there, huh? Well, Owen sent me that text like yeah, about, uh, the gas uh, the tenth, right? Yeah, the tenth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I. I man. What about you, Phil? I got really nothing going. I'm going to be probably in the books, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, usually, you know, you try and get together at least one or two. I'd love to hit up something, but yeah, stay focused. Well, I think that's uh, that's pretty much what we got time for tonight. Uh, Tony, you got anything else you want to bring up, man? No, I just want to uh, say to everybody who listens to this, it's all about America. It's got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with Jonathan. Phil, nobody. It's about America. Yeah. You know, whatever happens, happens, and uh, we'll all be good as long as we stay calm and bear arms. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, I just did what I did in my life. I'm no, I'm nobody special. Well, as much as you're going to say that, you are, you are and you were, so. No, I'm not. I'm just a regular cat, you know. Like, I'll have a beer with anybody. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I have a beer with anybody. I get, I drink all the time, and uh, that's okay. You know, whatever. Yeah. So what do you think about this studio compared to Jocko's? I, I heard you say it. I need to get that in recording, though. <laughs> well, well I, did, I did two with Jocko, and uh, it was kind of the same. Him, both of them were him and Echo Charles. Yeah. Shout out to Echo Charles. He's the fucking mm-hmm. best guy ever. He seems like a ginorm- like ginormous oh, man. Oh, yeah. He, he's, a, he's a friggin' monster, but such a good dude, man. <laughs> he's like the best guy you've ever met in your life. Yeah. And Jocko, well, yeah, well, he's my buddy, so whatever. But, uh, yeah, their first place, awesome. Their second place is at their gym. Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, we figured, like, why pay anything? We Did you gotta... do much of the uh, jujitsu while you were in the teams? No, of course not. Nothing like that, huh? No, I did all the uh, uh, bar fighting. <laughs> <laughs> the old-fashioned knuckles yeah. that way. Well, I'm kind of an alcoholic, so I did all the uh, drunk fighting and everything. And Actually... Nobody really wanted to roll with me because that's what they said. They used to go there at four o'clock in the morning and roll. Yeah, like, dude, I'm still at the bar at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but Jocko, man, he's he's like the man with that. Yeah, no, he's, Yeah, he is. He, he, you know what? He he, he's the best. He's like the best guy ever. Yeah, seems like it. He, whatever like you it. think about his podcast or whatever you see online, he is that guy. Oh, I love his podcast because you know what? It's he about, is that guy. He's he's exactly that guy. It's about leadership. If you don't like him, but go at the fuck same yourself, time, you know, it's about how can he better himself and how can you better yourself throughout the day. Yeah, but he's got no agenda. Yeah, I love that. He's That's got nothing. One he's of the like, thing, one of the many what? things I've replicated from his podcast. Is having no agenda and just talking about just it, just like you're doing right now, chum. Just talking. Yep. So, I appreciate you coming out there, Tony. Uh, Phil, you got anything else you want to say or bring up? Uh, no, Tony. I just uh, appreciate your service and uh, everything you do and you've done. Thank and you, I chum. You're, you're an inspiration to more people than you know, and uh, 
Oh my like god, I, I don't think uh, I don't think that. Well, but <laughs> I think you are. I think you are. It's uh no one's got anything but the high praise to say for you and you know. I am I'm just who I am. You've earned it. I like I like people and I think everybody should just be good, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, if you guys want to uh can anybody actually get a hold of you? You have any social media or just No, don't, not never. Don't contact me. I'm a ghost. <laughs> Swift silent. I, I have an Arizona phone number. I have a New Hampshire address and I live in Florida. If I can't find them. Go ahead. Yeah. Try to find me. <laughs> All right, then. Well, <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Uh, ho- Tony, hopefully we can do another one of these soon. And uh, All right, my brother. And we'll uh, go Thank- from there. Thanks a lot. You're, you're, I, th- this is awesome, man. You, you're, you're a wonderful person. I didn't even know they were doing this stuff. Appreciate it, man. I you are it. a really wonderful person. Thank you very much. Yeah, just trying to help people out there, and uh, yep. you know, we don't have that quite. We don't have a big following like Jocko, but we're try- we're getting out there and. Trying to come become well, big, so so all those people out there, you know, just live your life, work hard, and be a good person. You know, it, it's all gonna come back. You know, enough said. We'll all be good. Awesome. All right, guys. If you want to hear from us, you know where to find us. Out.